Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor David Freestone to the University of Wollongong on behalf of the UOW Global Challenges Program. Uh, this is uh, one of a series of talks of conversations with, and in this case we have a conversation with a, a leading international law scholar uh, and practitioner, and particularly an environmental law uh, practitioner with a particular interest in ocean affairs. Uh, but David, when I first met you, uh, you were based at the University of Hull, uh, which is a very, very long way away from your current location in Washington, D.C., and so occasionally in Bermuda and the Caribbean. And I, I, I wondered, given that it's, it's interesting from an early career researcher's perspective and indeed my own perspective, the trajectory of your research, how you ended up uh, where you are, and, and particularly, how did you end up in the outermost reaches of Yorkshire uh, and then escape that location to, <laughs> to, to perhaps greater things at the World Bank? Well, different things. Yeah, certainly. Well, yes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a alumnus of the University of Hull. I graduated from there. And my first university appointment was actually as a lecturer in, uh, at the university. I went back to my alma mater. And in, this was, we're talking 72, right? 72, 73. Um, and Hull was a very different place then than it is now. It was being rather depressed economy, but still, this was about at the time of the Cod Wars. So there were 175 stern trawlers used to go out of Hull. Um, so I come in as a young, keen international lawyer. Um, it was just the beginning of the Law of the Sea Committee, which was just opening. The discussions were there. I was interviewed by Yorkshire Television. I thought, oh, this is what it's going to be like to be an academic. It's a multimedia star. That was the only time they ever <laughs> but, uh, uh, but it was it was a big issue. And uh, a number of departments in the university had a big fisheries, including economics, which had a very, they, did a lot, they had a big contract with the Commonwealth Secretariat to train uh, fisheries economists throughout the world, and I was <coughs> roped in to do the Law of the Sea bit, which started, started as like an afternoon and then became a couple of days. So um, it was really because of the of Hull and the, the Law of the Sea interest that I actually sort of got it, that be able to to deal with Law of the Sea issues more more seriously. And then later um, they set up an incident we'd been spending. A, couple of days talking about interdisciplinary research, they set up an institute for estuarine and coastal studies, which was actually my first really serious interaction with geographers and biologists and environmental specialists. Um, and that kind of, that was been a, a quite important defining role for me. So um, we set up a journal. Indeed, the, the, the yeah. journal was, uh, strikes me as, a, as the next point of call because uh, you're the founding editor of the International Journal of Marine and Coastal Law, right. but I remember it in its first incarnation, which which included the word estuarine yes. uh, within it, and is that largely led by the fact that Hull sits on a, a rather uh, the yeah. substantial estuary of the River Humber, That's right. uh, which is the, the linkage. Oh, exactly. There. Yeah. So rather obscure word estuarine. I mean, marine, never all happy with, but so it was the Institute of Estuarine and Coastal Studies, and, and I put forward the idea for a journal that would look at international estuarine and coastal issues. I found a publisher, and it's, we started off as the International Journal, of, not the Yorkshire Journal, but the <laughs> International <laughs> Journal. Well, you estuarine. would have got more, more coverage from local TV, <laughs> I would suggest. No, yeah, so, so we started that off. It was a little esoteric. We did pretty well the first few years, and then... This was 30 years ago, I have to say, it started, started it. So you sustained years. three decades worth of and editing a, a major a, journal. Yeah, it's a labour of love. It wasn't a major journal when we started, it was pretty thin, but it's <laughs> become bigger and, uh, and I like to think more, you know, it's, it's one of the one, one or two leading journals on board the season. Mm -hmm. In about 19, uh, late 80s, we merged with marine policy reports from the University of Delaware and that's when we changed to international marine and coastal law, and that, you know, that's the title that it's had for the last 20 years. Well, to tell us about how, how the, the opportunity and the, the, the not necessarily better but different uh, experience of the World Bank occurred. Yeah. Well, I've had a interest, number of interesting, lucky opportunities, I think. Um, I, 
I was approached in 96 by the World Bank, who were looking for somebody to head their international environmental law team. Um, and I'd done quite a bit of work, um, particularly in the, uh, largely because of the journal, I was approached by the Commonwealth Secretariat in the late 80s to work uh, at a hardship post in Antigua. Antigua and Barbuda in the Caribbean. <laughs> we but, still have a house. That's just well, very I we're very, fell in love with it, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, so we were there, for, so the whole family went there for two years, which is an amazing place to, to be. So a great mid-career break, as it were. <laughs> but also for a young internet, well, I think I'm still relatively young there, uh, to, to be the legal advisor to a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, even of a fairly small country, is pretty amazing. Uh, so I used to handle some of the diplomatic correspondence, and they would send me to, when nobody else wanted to go, to international meetings, and particularly, um, uh, they sent me to, uh, particularly my request, actually, to the start of the Caribbean Environment Programme in Jamaica, which was started at the Cartagena Convention, came to force first in 81, came to force in, in the middle of the 80s, 86, uh, and the late 80s they started to develop a protocol on specially protected areas and wildlife, um, something I was interested in. And uh, so, they, so I headed the delegation for pretty well all the meetings of the negotiation of that. It made a real nuisance of myself <coughs> because I thought we should actually be, we should actually try and do something really special and different. Uh, UNEP was fairly keen to get it finished quickly and cheaply. Uh, but this went on now, instead of being one year's negotiation, it went on over about four years. We got finished in 1990 with what I think is um, state of the art, still uh, state of the art uh, <coughs> uh, protocol, which lists in uh, threatened and endangered species, lists protected areas. It has precautionary provisions. It says the, the parties. At this point, the US was one of the negotiators, and they were really unhappy about including the precautionary principle in it. But they did actually not object to. Uh, some precautionary wording, for example, that the, the parties should commit to uh, ensuring that they're or to preventing species from becoming threatened or endangered, which is precautionary. Uh, and a few other, so I've managed to sneak a few provisions like that into the agreement with, with uh, the, the complicity of, uh, actually the, the legal advisor was Dan Bodansky, who's now a very prominent uh, legal academic, was then a very junior uh, and legal advisors at the State Department, a long time friend as well. Okay. And how, how does that connect? All oh, right, to the, okay, the, sorry. The, the, the World yeah. Bank. So, uh, what is because so World Bank's day, looking yeah. around, yeah, okay, sorry. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, lot, of, lot of stories here. Um, okay. So, uh, basically, the World Bank was looking for somebody who'd had some experience in developing countries, and I think largely because of the work that we'd been doing in the Caribbean Environment Program, I was asked to go to some of the first meetings of the IPCC. Uh, um, I was on the Coastal Zone Management Subcommittee for a bit. Uh, and then uh, I did some work with uh, in Bangladesh on sea level rise with a team from New Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and a number of other sort of projects looking at the global environmental problems. So when it came about 96, when they approached me, I had kind of some kind of record of having death worked in developing countries, some understanding of the global agenda, etc. And this was after, 96 was a couple of years after the global environment facility had been restructured and, uh, within the World Bank. So they were ostensibly looking for a legal advisor. I say ostensibly because uh, the post that I responded to eventually and, and got was actually in the legal, uh, was the legal vice presidency of the legal office working with the general counsel. Um, but the, the Global Environment Facility actually already had a lawyer, a very able lawyer, Patricia Bliss, uh, Bliss Guest, who um, not technically the general counsel thought that, the, that all the legal advisors should sit in his department. Uh, so it was so, so the job wasn't some, quite what it said on the Not team. quite. One, one of the issues we've been talking about the last couple of days is around <coughs> multidisciplinary research and how in an academic environment you, you persuade uh, persuade the, the cats to be herded in vaguely the, the direction you might wish them to go. Uh, you've described to me before your role at the, at the World Bank as, as running 60 plus lawyers. 
Right. Uh, how do you how do you how do you make lawyers head in the? <laughs> These are serious cats, right? <laughs> yeah. So that basically, I was the I was head of the environmental international environmental law group for about eight years, and then I was promoted to deputy general counsel. But I was in charge of advisory services. So these are the expert lawyers. So my environmental law group, which had grown by then from five to eighteen, so a big group which covered a very large range of issues in court, including carbon trading, things like that. Uh, the legal aspects of it, um, and then I had three. So I had when, when I became deputy general counsel, I had the uh, environment group, the private sector group, the judicial reform group, all of which had chief chief counsels with policies, etc. So they report, they were direct reports, and the others would report through that. So a large group. The legal office was about two more than two hundred lawyers. Yeah, hurt cats, but all very talented people. It's very interesting, very collegial, nice. Environment, uh, but always the guys causing the problems in the projects. You know, have you done an environmental impact assessment? You know, has it been assessed? Does it actually meet the policy requirements? Uh, try and do this in a way which is not going to obstruct, be too bureaucratic, but actually, process, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's got a challenge to actually get this done in a collegial but effective way, and I think we've quite effectively done that. Very good. I one of the other issues I recall from one of my, my, my first meetings with you in the late 1980s is that an issue that you were particularly concerned with, and it's one of some of the earliest uh, international legal scholarship, is on the potential impacts of sea level rise uh, right. on particularly the maritime jurisdiction of coastal states. And that's been, uh, if not an abiding theme throughout your but certainly when you're one of the first, first to, be, to be writing on that issue. And now you're, you're a co-rapporteur on the International Law Association's uh, Committee on International Law and Sea Level Rise. Right. So what can international law do in the context of sea level rise? Well, it's not going to stop it. The sea level rise is going to disobey the convention that we create, or what? Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, one hopes that the international law would be the mechanism by which we actually mitigate the issue. Uh, you know, we're looking forward to the meeting in Paris in, you know, later this year to actually fi find some form of global arrangement. I say arrangement rather than treaty uh, advisedly. There will be legal components to it, I hope. But it, I think it won't be like the Kyoto Protocol. It won't be like the Framework Convention because of constraints from the US and others. But I'm hoping that we will. Yeah, I'm very po positive and I shall have cause to reflect looking at this later that I may be wrong. But I'm very positive about the about that process has been well managed and very different from the Copenhagen process in 2009, which was, which was a disaster. Yes, the whole bit. tone is different. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, they've took, there have been bottom-up commitments, national commitments. Um, a number of governments have, you know, the Chinese, the US, uh, Indians have now made national commitments, nationally determined contributions. Uh, so this is a bottom-up approach already. But the US are already, I think, making a noise about, you know, the Obama administration has started to uh, <coughs> implement changes under the Clean Air Act. Things are not subject to a lot of challenges, but they're pretty radical, and they will make major reductions. It would be better if they could actually address this through Congress, but that's obviously not going to happen. I fear not. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, in, in terms of the, the response, though, and now adaptation is now politically acceptable to talk about adaptation, because in the early days, developing countries quite naturally were saying, don't start talking about how we'll deal with all these problems. Stop it. it. Stop it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've now got to the point where we accept that we, you know, even if there is a, a, re a global regime which does have serious uh, reduction of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, that we still will feel effects. So I think adaptation has now become an important part of the work of the of the. Uh, uh, of the Climate Convention, and of course the funding as well. We've looked at the launch of the Green Climate Fund, which is in, in Korea, uh, which is capitalised over 10 billion. Uh, the promise at Copenhagen was 100 billion a year, so we'll see what's going to happen with that. But I think they're mobilising, the US is mobilising a lot of money from the, from the private sector, so you know, there's a, there is a lot of um, um, motive for that. So, what can in, international lawyers do? I think we have to reframe the way we look at some of these issues. So in, in 1988, we started to look at 
mean, this was the early days of international environmental law. There weren't that many people who were interested in it. Um, there's a very famous uh, story about Francois Behenne, who um, died last year, much, much loved, uh, who was the legal advisor to the IUCN uh, Law Centre in, in Bonn, and a young graduate student, very keen, came to her and said, um, you know, I really would like to become an international environmental lawyer. You know, how do I do it? And she said, well, there are only four of us. There's David and the World Bank, there's me, um, somebody at IUCN, uh, somebody in, uh, at UNEP, and, and uh, uh, you know, and basically that's that's all the jobs there are. None of them are none of us are leaving. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no that was uh, that's amazing. That's twenty years ago, and now look at it. I mean, it's their L master's degrees, and and I actually put this question to her kind of some years ago and said, "Is so apocryphal the story?" She said, "No, it's true." And she, I think, she said, and then she said, "Actually, no, I think I said there were only three. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's you know, it was a great opportunity to become you know, the, you know, to, to work in the World Bank in that role because it was you know, it was groundbreaking. Now you you know." International Environmental Law, LLMs. It's a legitimate and proper career path, which uh, both professionally and academically, etc., is, is good. So it's really come of age. So it's a positive story. Absolutely. It's opportunity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's coming into the field. Absolutely. So I sort of answered your question about the International Law Association. When we started looking at sea level, that was the issue that I chose. We actually did a special issue of, of um, it was the British branch of the International Law Association in the late 80s was looking at, at climate change and I actually did the chapter on the precautionary principle for this and also one on sea level rise and that as a result of the work I was doing with the coastal geomorphologists in Hull actually, John Pethick who'd done a lot of work on, on the impacts of sea, sort of sea level rises on, on, on the dynamic coasts etc. And so we looked at uh, what the international law uh, position was and uh, David Caron has said this is, you know, international law is actually an obstruction because it doesn't contemplate this sort of change. And so we were looking, I'm not sure if I entirely agree with that, but certainly we were looking at the ways in which um, international law possibly could respond, either with new norms or by, with a new convention. I naively suggested that a, in, in that paper in 88, we, perhaps you could have a protocol to the Framework Convention on Climate Change on Sea Level Rise seemed a good idea in 1989 before they'd actually finished the negotiation of the protocol and we realised what a morass the framework convention was going to be in. 194 parties discussing 194 issues mostly at the same time. I have a very, very talented colleague who said she was at the last meeting she was sitting in a, in a on one of these non-meetings, you know, you have a non, you have a non-parties, you have non-papers and you have non-meetings, that means you don't get translation effectively. Uh, otherwise, it, if it's an official meeting, it has to have translation and all the backup for the secretariat. So he was in one of these meetings, and the jargon, is, she's a woman who's an insider, has become so esoteric that she didn't realise for 20 minutes what they were talking about. You know, we were talking about section four and section five and some, you know, and then, you know, references to some of these acronyms. So, uh, so it's become very esoteric and very bogged down. So I think if we can reach and again, I'm going off there, but if we can reach an agreement in Paris that we start, we start the process again, you know, establish some new baselines for, for moving forward with this with a, a proper mitigation regime, which includes, will include all the countries. Fantastic. I, I, I now am going to stay within the environmental law and ocean sphere, uh, but forgive me for the way I phrase this question, but I understand that your favourite uh, animal uh, is uh, uh, the eel. <laughs> uh, be, it, be, be they from uh, Europe or, uh, or, or North America. Right. Can, you, can you explain to us why the eel is so fascinating <laughs> and why you're so obsessed? <laughs> As uh, Michael Caine was saying, not many people know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I, I retired from the mandatory retirement from the World Bank then in 2008, and uh, uh, I like living in Washington. Uh, and uh, IUCN took me in, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And, he went on office. They hired me to GW, to George Washington University Law School, where I still teach. But I was a visiting professor there for two years. Um, and then I was keen to, after managing 
a lot of management work at the World Bank. I wanted to do go back to some of the things I was really interested in, like being an academic, but also enjoy you know, the practical side of this. So, so I became involved in a number of projects uh, with UNDP, actually, in, in Africa. And uh, then I was approached to actually be part of a team that was responding to a challenge laid down by Sylvia Earle, you know, the, 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 the marine scientist, who's been talking since the 1980s about having what she called in 1988 wild ocean reserves. So this is setting aside areas of the high seas. Um, and I actually went to a meeting she had, I met her in 1988, it was in Hawaii. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to a meeting in Hawaii, paid for by NOAA, <laughs> when she was the chief advisor. And really interesting, seemed to me totally impossible, 1988. So maybe we've gone a bit further with this. So then she had put some, forward some ideas of hope spots, she called them, hot spots. Like areas of real critical um, ecosystem significance, species significance. And one of them is the Sargasso Sea, which has a real ring to it. That's a very romantic ring. It's well in the Bermuda Triangle. So I have not been to Bermuda, so I was invited to join this trip to, to Bermuda to uh, talk. I, I, I might challenge your idea of romance, but... <laughs> <laughs> we can just talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, fantastic trip to Bermuda. Bermuda government taking a very interest, long, big interest in this as something that they would take leadership on. So we, this, was, this would be in, what, 2000? End of 2000, yeah, end of 2000, beginning of 2010. Um, and as a result of their interest and ICN espousing this, a number of donors stepped up and put up a substantial amount of money to. And there is a New York connection. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> we, are we not against the climate? No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> These stories have to be told, probably. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, the significance of the SARC SOC then, all right, coming to that point. As is, long as there's a needle in the punch, yeah, right. uh, <laughs> yeah, is that uh, the SAC has many. It, the, the first thing the director, director general of the IECN said to me when I met her after I got the post to run this project, the subsequent year, was, "Where is the SAC <laughs> So if the director general of IECN doesn't know, you can be excused for not. Uh -huh. But it's basically around Bermuda. It's in the gyre around the north. It's the subtropical gyre of, of uh, the North Atlantic. The, the, the Sargasso Sea is the only place where, coming to the point now, where the European eel, anguilla, anguilla, and the American eel, anguilla rostrata, where they spawn. So they're catadromous, those of you who read the Law of the Sea Convention. <laughs> so we know about anadromous species like salmon. So catadromous are the opposite. Instead of actually living their life in salt water and breeding in fresh water, they, they actually live in fresh brackish water and then migrate 3,000 miles to the Sargasso Sea and really scientists don't know why. Uh, it's never been seen, nobody's ever witnessed a spawning, an eel spawning event. <coughs> um, so this is about 3,000, about 350 miles south of Bermuda uh, in the middle of what we call the Sargasso Sea, although the link even with the Sargasso is unclear. Uh, and then they spawn and die. And small leptocephali, the very tiny creatures that hatch, find their way back. I don't think they go back to the same rivers that their parents were in, but we don't know that. Uh, but they certainly find their way. Over a year or so, they're swept by the currents of the gyre back to, and the, and the European ones go back to Europe, and the American ones go back to, to, uh, to, to Americas. And... Um, the European eel is now critically endangered. The American eel is, is, is endangered according to the IACN Red List. The European eel is, is critically endangered and the EU is taking fairly drastic measures on restricting catches and uh, export sale because it's been, they're being caught, or they have been, and certainly the American ones are being caught and then exported to China where they're being fattened up for the Japanese sushi market. Uh, so they're miles, even if they escape, they've got no kind of way of reproducing so far from the, their homeland. So it's quite, a, it's, quite a, it's quite a sad story. I think I, one suspects it may have something to do with the changes in the spawning area, but there are other, a lot of other pressures on them as well. So basically I agreed to take on the Sargasso Sea. It's also interesting for a number of other reasons. It's the only, uh, it 
it's, it's in, a, in a unique ecosystem where uh, supports turtles and a lot of other uh, important commercial species, nice. bird fish, etc. But what we're trying to do with this project is to use existing international law uh, organisations which have competence in the high seas, not all of them do, but uh, to actually put protection measures in place. So to do what Sylvia Earle was saying we should do in 1988, this is a practical way of doing it in an incremental way. So you look at fishing regulation, the only two fishing bodies which have any power in this particular part of the, uh, of the high seas are ICAT, the, what, what um, WWF is called the International Conspiracy to Catch All Tunes. Uh, there was a, was a website to that effect which was taken down fairly quickly, but it's but it, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, uh, they have for, for tunas and tuna like species. Um, and the only general fisheries convention is NAFO, which only is the North, Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization, which just the, the top, say, from above 38 north is, is, is within that. And then fish. Uh, uh, vessel impacts, you know, the International Maritime Organization, seabed mining, which is we're talking about this just now. Seabed mining, exploration and mining is governed by the Seabed Authority. And there's some interest in uh, Michael Lodge, who's the Secretary General. His hair is beyond national jurisdiction. That's right, yes, sir. yes, exactly. So we talked to them about we've actually just become an observer at the Seabed Authority. And we were hoping certainly that some areas could be set aside as areas of particular environmental interest. Um, and there are a number of other bodies which are interested as well, including, back to eels, the conventional migratory species. And one of our, su <coughs> one of our successes has actually been with the support of uh, one of the governments that signed the declaration that we uh, brokered in Bermuda last year, was the government of Monaco actually put forward a science case which we developed uh, to have the European eel listed under Appendix 2 of of the conventional migratory species, which means signifies that it's a, a species which would benefit from international, which is which is under threat, but which would benefit from international collaboration. Well, David, thank you ever so much for, for those insights into the trajectory of your your research career and some of the, the fascinating issues that you're, you're you've been engaged with. Uh, I'd like to, to ask everyone to, to thank David for, for his uh, contribution, and it's been a pleasure having a conversation with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>